Welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm Chris Lee Kennedy, and this is the show where we bring you the day's biggest movie news, and of course, we give you insight into what it all means. Joining me, as always, is AMC Movie News Editor-in-Chief, Mr. John Campia. Well, greetings and a most heartfelt salutations, everybody. Welcome to the show, coming to you live from right here at the Stream.TV studios here in Hollywood, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. We also have joining us AMC Movie News Production Manager, Mr. Dennis Sen. Hope everyone had a good weekend. We, I went to Vegas, had a blast, and then we came I back. I keep and, forgetting you went to yes, Vegas this weekend. because I, I showed up at the Geeky Wars right. yesterday, you know, and we had a lot of fun. We didn't win, but we still had a lot of fun. We did have a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes, we did. And we also have joining us the director of the upcoming film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, Mr. John Schnapp. Yes, we were at the Geekies yesterday, and uh, the House of Secrets uh, comic book girl won, and yay, yeah, congratulations. We love her. Yeah, yeah. she's awesome. All right, guys, the weekend box office numbers are in with a couple of small surprises with none of the three new films cracking the top two spots. Staying in the number one spot is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, taking in $28.4 million. In second place is Guardians of the Galaxy, taking $24.7 million. And this is the comedy, Let's Be Cops, scratching out $17.7 million. In fourth is Expendables 3, making just $16.2 million. And in the fifth spot is the new film, The Giver, making just over $12 million. John, your thoughts on the box office results this weekend? Um, pretty good, actually. I mean, Turtles uh, didn't take that big of a drop, which is expected because nothing big opened up, like nothing that was going to have any success opened up this weekend. Uh, it holding on number one. It looks like Guardians of the Galaxy, which has crossed like $221 million now domestically. Guardians of the Galaxy, they're saying right now, has a chance to be the number one box office movie of the year for the U.S., for the North American market. Wow. It's uh, 21 or $20 like million dollars away from Transformers uh, 4, which they said it will cross. It will beat that. And then, technically speaking, Captain America was not a summer movie. Uh, so it'll definitely become the number one summer movie. Might even have a chance. It's got 37 more millions to go. That's a long stretch uh, to catch Captain America for the number one domestic movie of the year. Uh, it won't catch them internationally, though. It just it hasn't built up an audience yet internationally. Tough times for Sylvester Stallone, my friends. Tough times. Um, the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first Expendables movie had an opening weekend of like $34 million. Mm -hmm. The second Expendable movie is open to $29 million. And now this one opens to $16 million. Now, a lot of people are want to rush and, and say, oh, well, John had a lot of people tweeting me. They say, well, it's because it, it got on a line first. It got online, and that's what killed it. And I said, no, that's not what killed it. And they said, John, the report number right now, some people are saying two point something. The actual number is like 1.6 million people probably downloaded that movie. That's like, a, that's like $16 million at the box office, that would have made all the difference in the world. It's like, yeah, but studies prove that less than, just under 10% of people who illegally download a movie would have actually bought a ticket anyway. So really, you're talking about $1 million difference. It didn't really make a difference. Fact of the matter is, even though I really love the second Expendables, I had a lot of fun with the second Expendables, people, they never generated any buzz with this film. They, whether it's because people were already tired of it, whether it's because they just started bringing in the wrong people in addition. I thought Wesley Snipes was a nice addition. I thought Harrison Ford was a good addition. I thought Mel Gibson was a good addition. But it didn't resonate with the audience. And for whatever reason, they just never went. They were not interested in it. The reviews weren't enough to get big positive word of mouth going. So am I shocked that Expendables 3 did not do great? No. Am I a little bit surprised that it finished with 16 million on its opening weekend? Yeah. Schnapp, what do you think? David Hyde Pierce. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, those names when they brought that those that kind of an actor into the Expendables three, it's like he wasn't an '80s action star. I don't have problems with him as an actor. It just seemed like they were cheapening the brand by like, hey, we're gonna scrape and scrimp in everybody. You know, it's like let's add this person and pepper it in with this person. You know, I think the ad campaigns were also done really wrong. I think hmm. Expendables two, I loved Expendables two. I, I I liked Expendables. I loved Expendables two because it had that that wink in joke kind of feel. It was still rated R, it still had all that 80s action. This film just felt like a strange, like the, the weak brother, you know, like the bad sequel. Even though all the original people were in it, it didn't have that like, you know, <coughs> we're back. I wanted to see like a lot of action scenes, like big explosions in the trailers. And instead it was just like a, a series of names. 
Yeah. So I think they were just really like kind of like patting patting each other on the back that look at all the people that are in this third movie as opposed to show a real trailer, show what the story's about. Yeah, and by David Tyler Pierce, you mean Kelsey Grammer. That's, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, that's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a year ago, would we have expected that Let's Be Cops was gonna beat The Expendables? I mean, let's A be... week ago, <laughs> would we have expected no. Let's Be Cops? No. No. I think, no. I think a week ago we might have, but like a year ago, we wouldn't have thought that, because you know, Let's Be Cops, you know, Damon Wayans Jr., and I forgot the, the other actor from the new girl's name. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they're kind of known, but they're not. The Expendables has a huge list of stars that people have known for a while. It just looks like maybe the novelty has worn off. Like the, the yeah. idea of bringing all these guys together. I love the second Expendables. I didn't care for the first one. So when I heard Stallone was going to make this PG-13 and that they wanted to shy away from some of the campiness of the second one, I was really worried. I think yeah. that turned some people off. And, and I don't know. I, it, it's a bunch of different factors, but it definitely was a surprise. In terms of Guardians, yeah, I think even if it doesn't pass Captain America 2, it's still a huge surprise success. Oh my I, gosh, I, I'm yes. still sick of these people. Oh, well, we knew it's going to be a huge success. Yeah, shut please, up. <laughs> please. Uh, but that that is really cool because it deserves it. All right, what's next? Did any of you guys see Expendables 3 yet? Nope. Yeah. You did? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, because I was actually going to say I actually liked the third better than the second and the first, and they did have some of that quirky comedy from the second. It just wasn't as cheesy, so. Oh, the cheesy is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck With the third yeah. installment of the new Star Trek franchise heading to AMC theaters in 2016 to coincide with the franchise's 50th anniversary, writer-director Roberto Orsi has taken to the web to announce that he and co-writers Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne have officially finished the first draft of the script script for the new film. However, he gave no story details. Dennis, with the first draft being complete and some time having been passed since the announcement, how are you feeling about Roberto Orsi to lead Star Trek film? Uh, I still feel the same. Apprehensive. I mean, I, I like Roberto Orsi. I like some of the stuff that he's written, especially the stuff on Fringe. And he's worked on, you know, a bunch of blockbusters, some hit, some miss. Uh, but it's his first directorial debut and it's on a big movie on a big franchise yeah so I am nervous and I know he's gotten experience in terms of being on set of these major movies and on television shows so he's got to see uh, people direct and stuff but it's a different animal you know it's, it's mm -hmm. one thing to just sit there and watch you know we saw that with Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller, they did Sin City, which was which we loved, right? Mm -hmm. Frank they, Miller got to watch Rodriguez direct. Right. Surely the spirit will be awesome. Exactly. Right. And then <laughs> we came out with that, and everyone's like, it's going to be just as awesome as Sin right. City. No. Wah, and so wah. that's why I'm worried. I'm not saying he won't do a good job. I'm just saying I'm a little nervous. Schnepp, how are you feeling about it now? I'm still uh, equally as apprehensive. Even though I, I said earlier, it's like, well, look, he's been on set and he's helped write the original, the, the two new versions of Star Trek. So if there's anyone who knows this universe and, and the way everything's working for the third one, it would be Orsi. Him as a director, it's hard to tell. It's, it is, it's, it's a totally, I agree completely, it's totally different than watching someone you know, work with workshop with actors and workshop with how the cameras and did we get everything? You're watching that and you're like, yeah, you know, and then, oh, no, it's you. No, you have to do it. What? You know, <laughs> you have to tell that actor that did he did he get the line? Did, is it going to match with the other thing? Did, is he in the right mood? I mean, it's like it is a totally different beast. But look, they gave him the role. So he's doing it, I'm sure. All that pressure and everything we're saying, he's looking in the mirror every morning like, this is me. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. So. I, I am also, I'm gonna, that's the magic word for this story. It's a little apprehensive. I mean, look, is Roberto Orsi the guy I would have chosen for this film? No. But am I a fan of Roberto Orsi? And the answer to that is yes. He's, he's written some very terrible movies, but he's also written some really cool movies, and I really like what he's done with the Star Trek franchise so far. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people will say to me, well, John, why would you say you're okay? And that's, that's the word, is okay. Okay with Roberto Orsi starting up with Star Trek as his first film when, you know, a long time ago, when, when Peter Jackson, remember, was going to produce a Halo movie, mm -hmm. and they announced that they got this guy named Neil Blomkamp, who has never directed anything but his own mm -hmm. short films. Right. He's never been a producer, never been an assistant director, never been anything on any film ever. He's, as far as I know, he's never even been on a movie set. And Peter Jackson uh, pegged him to be the director for Halo, this big multi-million dollar tentpole, huge blockbuster film, right? And I was like, I guarantee you the studio's going to pull the plug on this. And sure enough, the studio pulled the plug on it. Say, so how come you're okay with him? He's never directed before. And you weren't okay with Blomkamp at the time. Remember, District 9 had not come out yet. Right. And we'd all said, 
Look, it'd be better if this guy Blomkamp does something of his own first and then worry about giving him a big blockbuster. And look how District 9 turned out. It was yeah. awesome. The difference, though, is Orsi has worked on around 17,000 movies. He's <laughs> produced a lot of films. He's yeah. written some of the big blockbusters. This is, Star Trek is his franchise so far. He's been the writer and been on set and been around JJ mm -hmm. for the first two Star Trek films. So there is a key difference there. Still, would he have been my choice as his first movie to direct? No, but I take solace in the fact that there is probably nobody on the planet right now who knows this Star Trek franchise better than him. So that, that's that got to count for something. Let me say this. Matthew Vaughn started out as Guy Ritchie's producer. And look at how look he at turned him. out. So, I mean, it, there are those transitional things where, you know, you got to give people a break and then... If Star Trek Three sucks, we, we, we're going to be pointing it. Or see if it's <laughs> yeah. if it's awesome, he gets elevated. Yeah. One other thing I want to mention: Star Trek continues from the Geekies. Those guys won. I watched all three episodes yesterday. Great job! Didn't they do great? Incredible! I, 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 someone incredible turned me series. on them just a little while ago. And I, I like, wish I had seen the series before, because then I would have been all nerding. Like <laughs> he, he did a good job as Kirk, but instead I was like, yeah, whatever, dudes, good job. But I haven't seen it. Then I watched it last night. Watched all three of them. They nail like all it's the, incredible. the special effects and everything it's too. It's just right? like the old Star Trek. Yep. You guys got to check this out. It's online. So, all right, folks, we reached that part of the show for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Crystal Lee's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Crystal Lee, what do we got? In a recent interview with Total Film, actor Stellan Skarsgård confirmed that he is returning for Avengers Age of Ultron, reprising his role of Dr. Eric Selvig. For the fourth time, Skarsgård said the following, I'm going to be in Avengers Age of Ultron, a small appearance. It's something really nice. Yeah, I was naked again. They <laughs> called my agent and said, do you think Stellan will mind being naked? My agent laughed his head off. Yeah, I almost insist. <laughs> Schnapp by herself, Stellan Skarsgård returning naked for Avengers Age of Ultron. <laughs> I uh, buy it 100%. I want to film just as the original news crew, like him skimping around on the streets naked, like saying, they're coming back or something. The robots are here. You know, I love it. I buy it. Dennis? I buy it as well. But I don't expect anything more than a gag cameo. He's just going to have a cameo. It's going to la play for laughs. And then he's going to go out. Because in the first, I think, what, the first Thor and Avengers, he was a serious role. And mm -hmm. then suddenly in Thor 2, it's like a funny role. But it's weird for me to see him like that because the first time I ever saw him in a movie was Lars, Lars Ventures' Breaking the Waves. And if you've ever seen that, mm -hmm. that's a far different role than what he's doing now. Right. Um, I, I buy this 100%. And Stellan Skarsgård, to me, and, and the Dr. Selvig character, kind of represents one of the things that Marvel has done so well with their films so far. And that is, hey, do they have these great big characters? Yes, they do. But all their movies so far have been peppered with these really great little side characters. Mm -hmm. And even if you're just looking at Thor, whether it's Sarsgaard or the girl from Two Broke Girls, what's her name? Uh, Kat Dennings. Kat right. Dennings, who's really great in that. And look at all of them. They've always got these really great... Uh, whether it's comic relief or just adding a new dimension to the story, they've got these great side characters. Selvig has been one of those for this, for the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is going to be his fourth appearance. We forget about that. For me, it's a big buy. I bet there's going to just be a scene like at the Avengers, you know, compound with him just cooking breakfast naked. <laughs> <laughs> Why just not? Just like a walk, walk through. It's like, don't, a don't ask. You know, <laughs> like one of those things. All right, what's next? One of the final remaining films for Robin Williams is the comedy Absolutely Anything, in which Williams plays the voice of Simon Pegg's dog. However, Pegg recently revealed that Williams may not have actually completed his voiceover work for the film and may be cut from it. Pegg said the following, I'm not sure Robin had completed doing his voice in the movie. He was doing the voice of my dog, and I hoped that he had completed it because it would be a real shame not to have him in it. And of course, there would be a degree of sadness there, but the work he did do would have been done with his usual verve and brilliance. John, if Williams had indeed not finished his work on absolutely anything, would you buy or sell them cutting him from the film? Um, this is going to surprise some people, but I, I would buy it. I, I mean, I know there are going to be some people that want to jump up and down and say to, to cut Robin Williams out of it would be disrespectful. And look, you all know how we feel about the passing of Robin Williams. We've, been, we've gone on about that a lot. But the fact of the matter is the world goes on. And you have to do what you have to do. They're making a movie. And, and now they have a voice if, if he had not finished the recordings at the time. And if, I mean, I'm sure if they're like 95% done, they could find a way to make it work. But if that he hadn't completed enough of it to really make it work, instead of jarring the movie and getting somebody in who maybe kind of sounds like Robin Williams or whatever, 
you got to do what you got to do for your for your uh, for your project and for your movie. Look, I said this before. If you worked at a Ford plant and you know one of your friends died at the Ford plant, they're not going to shut the Ford plant down for today because life does have to go on. We grieve, we mourn, we remember, we celebrate, and all that kind of stuff. And then Robin Williams was the consummate professional too. So like, if you were to ask Robin Williams, hey Robin, you're going to pass away next week for whatever reason, uh, you hadn't finished, you've only done six percent of your work, do you think they should keep you in or do you think she should pull him out? I'm sure Robin Williams would have said, no, you get somebody else in to, to do the work. I mean, I, I think that's the way. So personally, even though it feels weird to say it, I would buy that they replace his voice. Dennis? Yeah, I buy it as well because they do have to finish the film and if he didn't finish recording it, then they have to find someone else. I mean, what are they going to do? Hire like a Robin Williams impersonator? I think that might be <laughs> more insulting. I mean, unless it's like he did like 99% and like they just need a few throwaway lines yeah, yeah, or something like that. Yeah, just need a few that. syllables here or there. Exactly. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah, they should do what's best for the movie. Though I hope to see on Blu-ray or DVD they have like some sort of like some scenes, not the whole movie, but like a few scenes here and there with his voice so we could see what it would have been. That's a great idea. I love that idea. Shana. Yeah, it's really hard to tell. I mean, you know, Peg is uh, is saying maybe they didn't finish everything. I don't know if he knows. Why would he make a comment like that unless he does know? So it seems like maybe he's preparing people to be like, hey, the voice is going to be replaced by, even though it was announced. You know, I mean, the only reason they would say anything like that is because they, they didn't get all of the voice. Like when Heath Ledger passed away, they had all of the Joker in the can. Yeah. There was a few, maybe one or two ADR scenes, which is like after the movie's filmed, the actor comes in and loops the dialogue. But you know, once they had all of his dialogue recorded, you know, so they didn't have to cut anything. I'm pretty sure they just weren't able to add anything. Uh, with something like this, even if they have 95% of all the audio recorded, they can't change anything when mm. they go into the right. studio and they're editing. You're stuck with that dialogue. Oh, this scene's not working. Well, we want to have the dog say this. You can't bring that actor back in to change the scenes or to rework stuff right. or to fix the ending or to add a beginning. So it kind of locks you in. So even if they had Robin Williams come in and do what's called a scratch track, which usually is a different actor, like it's, a not, it's not the final voiceover actor. They just lay down all the dialogue, and that's called a scratch track. But sometimes they bring the actual actor in, hey, just just run this through, and let's just get the entire script, then we'll come in and flavor it later. So it's hard to tell what they actually have or what they didn't have, but I agree with Dennis. If they do have to replace him, it would be great to at least like get a couple of scenes with him in there. That would the be DVD. great. All right, what's next? Mission Impossible 5 director Christopher McQuarrie has taken to Twitter to announce that actor Ving Rhames is indeed returning to the franchise once again. Aside from Tom Cruise, Rhames is the only actor to appear in all of the Mission Impossible films. Dennis, by yourself, Ving Rhames returning for Mission Impossible 5. I buy it and I want to see more of him because he was just had a little cameo mm -hmm. in, in the last yeah. one. I feel like... He's part of it. I mean, obviously, it's Tom Cruise's franchise, but he's kind of like the, the guy that's been all in all of them, and he's like the second fiddle. And so I hope that he has a bigger role in the next one. And, I, you know, after Pulp Fiction, I thought Ving Rhames was going to be in a lot more movies, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he was for a while, but he's kind of tapered off. And so this is kind of the big franchise that he's kind of associated with now, yeah. and I, I'm hoping that they bring him back in a big step, in a big way. What, what about Piranha? <laughs> Like, what, what are you talking about? No, I, I love Ving Rhames. He's kind of like the Q in some ways to James Bond. Not that he's just the gadgets guy, but in that you always now just kind of expect to see him. I agree with you completely. My one disappointment with, with uh, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, and I really like yeah. that film. I think it's the best of the franchise. Yeah. I, I wanted more Ving Rhames. Right. I wanted Ving Rhames to be part of that core team. Uh, but at least he, he makes an appearance, and that's great. I do hope, while I buy this, my buy is contingent upon it's more than just a brief cameo. He doesn't have to be starring Tom Cruise and Ving Rhames, right. but, but make it more than just a brief cameo, I hope. Schnepp, what do you think? I agree. I buy that he's back in. I kind of equate sometimes his career to Danny Trejo, where it's like, yeah. you know, he's, he's in everything, but it's not the high quality everything. He's just, you know, he's, he's making his money. He's, he's a solid actor in anything he's in, but sometimes it's like a subpar movie, but that's how it works. I mean, actors can't always pick their... You know, I'm in every blockbuster. It just doesn't work that way. With this, I thought Simon Pegg was in all the other ones. Did he miss one of them? I think Ghost Protocol was the first one he was in. No, Simon Pegg? Was, no, was, was he in the, the third? He was in the third one. And he was in the I first one, too. Uh, uh, I don't think he was in the first no, one. No, he was not really? in the first one. Yeah, the first one is a totally different cast. All right, we're going to have to look this <laughs> up. Cause I almost, I'm almost positive that he was I in don't, it. Even now that we're talking about it, I don't remember him in the third one. Yeah. This is crazy. I'm going to have to go look it up. Yeah, I don't he's remember definitely him in at least three of them. So, yeah, uh, yeah uh, I'm happy that Rames is a re uh, reappearing, you know.
All right. Well, folks, we reached out part of the show for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Email in your questions. Maybe we'll get to them here on AMC Movie Talk. Maybe we'll get to them on AMC Mailbag on the weekends. We'll do our best to get to your question. Now, I'm going to let you know, too, if you're watching us live, we're going to try to save just a couple of minutes at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching live, you can tweet in some questions to at AMC Movie News, and Chris Lee will pick out a couple at the end of the show. But for now, let's get to the mailbag questions. So, Chris Lee, what do we have? Nikia Courtney writes, I just recently subscribed to your YouTube channel. Your show is insightful and entertaining. I just saw The Expendables 3 today, and I heard a rumor that Jackie Chan and Nicolas Cage were supposed to be in it. I was wondering what happened to them. Um, first of all, thank you for subscribing to the channel. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I Stallone wanted Jackie Chan in this. Stallone was even tweeting publicly about it. And I know Jackie Chan wanted to be a part of it. But right from the beginning, there were these rumors that Jackie Chan had a couple of other projects that may not allow him, that he was already contractually obligated to, that may not allow him to go and uh, film Expendables 3 when they were filming it. And even though Stallone kept wanting it and Chan Stark kept wanting it, it didn't happen. I don't know how close the Nicolas Cage thing ever came. I know Stallone once mentioned Nicolas Cage, but I don't know if that ever even got close. I'm I was always disappointed that Jackie Chan didn't end up being there. If there's somebody who really should be in a film like this, it's Jackie Chan. Would that have made a big difference in the box office? No. Maybe internationally. <laughs> uh, not so much domestically, but it would have been really fun seeing him in there. Uh, so to the best of my knowledge, that's what we've got. Have you guys heard anything else? I remember hearing that, uh, you know, <laughs> I knew what, what plane Nicolas Cage was taking to Bulgaria to film Expendables 3, <laughs> and then that fell apart. But, uh, yeah, I'm disappointed that Jackie Chan uh, wasn't a part of this. If they do Expendables 4, by some strange incident, they should make sure that it's Sylvester Stallone, Jackie Chan, Nicolas Cage, you know, and Arnold. <laughs> and then everybody else, you know, it doesn't really matter. They'll just make a really cool, tight, like, small action film, but use the Expendables franchise name. I think, you know, you could still keep moving with the Expendables. It's not a dead franchise, so. I read somewhere that Kelsey Grammer, the role that he ended up taking was the one Nicolas Cage was supposed to take. Ah, uh, okay. So, well, that, that would make sense, sense actually. actually. That makes sense. All right, what's next? Kevin Sorkin writes, hey guys, love the show and was wondering which movie you guys think should win the Oscar for best animated movie, the Lego movie or How to Train Your Dragon 2 or some other movie that I missed. Personally, I loved both, but like How to Train Your Dragon 2 a little bit more. Dennis, start with you. Which one would you say? Well, I definitely would go with uh, the Lego movie. I loved it. I thought it was hilarious and, and uh, it's actually one of my favorite movies of the year. I liked How to Train a Dragon 2. The thing is, it's one of those rare movies, same with the first one where I like them, but I have no clue why I don't love them like everyone mm, else does. Mm. Like everyone else loves the franchise. They love the first one, they love the second one, and I can't even tell you why. Because usually I would say, oh, I right. didn't like this, this bothered me. Nothing bothered me about the movie. I just liked it, didn't love it. So for me, it's easy, Lego. Sure. Well, it's definitely Lego for me, and I kind of liked the second one. I loved the first Dragon movie. The second one for me, I just, and I could tell you why I didn't love it, or even kind of like, I didn't even like it that much. It was like the characters, all the dragons at the end, it just, it felt too much. The character, the main villain was really paper thin. I just, it didn't capture me the way the first movie did. So I just, it just felt like I was watching kind of a lot of the same stuff. While as in Lego movie, it was like, completely fun, the whole movie. We're going, we're moving around through this entire world. Uh, it was a lot of fun, it was very funny too, so. I might have liked How to Train Your Dragons 2 more than the first How to Train Your Dragons. Right. I, I mean, might have, I, I mean, it's, to me, I really enjoyed it, I thoroughly enjoyed that movie. But before I declare Lego Movie or How to Train Your Dragons 2, let's not forget, there are other animated films. Sure. This year, Box Trolls is still to come out. Now, I haven't been won over by the trailers yet, but a lot of people are really looking forward to this. Box Trolls could make an impact. Uh, don't forget, uh, Big Hero 6 yep. is still to come out, right? Mm -hmm. We've got Book of Life, that Guillermo del Toro uh, produced right. one that could. And let's not forget, Scooby-Doo Goes to WrestleMania. I know. <laughs> how can, I mean, how can yeah. we discount Scooby-Doo Goes yeah. to WrestleMania? That's probably going to win the Oscar, guys. <laughs> but uh, I think for me, as much as I loved How to Train Your Dragon 2, it's still got to be the Lego movie. Uh, I, I mean, I was, it's one of those movies, you know, every once in a while you see a movie where you're still just bouncing when you come out of the theater. And I remember coming out of theater for the Lego movie the first time. And I missed, it's one of those comedies, forget animation, it's one of those comedies where you miss half the jokes 
the first mm. time you see it because they hit you with a gag, everybody's laughing, and the next gag comes while everybody's still laughing and you don't hear what's going on. So I ended up seeing how, uh, Lego like four times in theaters, and every time I went to the theater, I heard a joke I hadn't mm -hmm. heard the time before. It's just a really thoroughly entertaining movie, so for me, I will also have to agree with you guys and go with the Lego movie so far, but let's not forget about these other right. ones still that come out. All right, what's next? Uh, we're going to the Twitter questions now. Was that two mailbag that questions? That was two. All right, let's go to the Twitter feed then. Sundal Jeppet says, after not so good Expendables 3 ratings, is Patrick Hughes going to do the Raid remake right? Man, I, this has got to raise some flags for people. Look, I, I think the reason people did not go out to see Expendables 3 has nothing to do with who was directing it. And I think they know that, and the producers of, of the Raid know that. Um... I don't, I don't think that Expendables 3 is a particularly horrible movie. <laughs> so, uh, t for me personally, it has, it has done nothing to move my needle as far as the Raid remake goes. It has not made me any more excited for it, certainly. But it hasn't done anything to diminish my, my enthusiasm or my mediocre enthusiasm for it either. So, for me, no effect whatsoever. What about you guys? Um, I think this is for a little bit of a side note. I'm, I was actually... And obviously, it wouldn't have impacted the box office at all. But I was actually uh, disappointed that Simon West didn't do the third Expendables because I, mm. I love what he does with action, mm -hmm. you know, with the mechanic and Con Air and stuff yeah. like that. And so, when he didn't return, that that turned me off a little bit. But I don't know. I, I, I have to. I haven't, see, I haven't seen Expendables three yet, so I have to watch it and then judge from there. I haven't seen Expendables three yet, but uh, my feeling about the Raid remake is firm. I don't care about it. I think the Raid was already made. It was made a couple of years ago, and the Raid 2 is one of the most incredible action films I've seen all year, maybe of all time. The Raid 2, I don't need to see a remake this soon. I mean, if it was like 10 years from now, sure, but like, you know, let's, let's learn how to read subtitles and get into the rest of the world. There's a whole world of movies, and the Raid and the Raid 2 are part of it, so. Directed by Garrick, uh, Gareth Evans. Yeah, an incredible job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but we do have to keep in mind, too, we live in a world of what is actually happening, not what, not what should be happening. Should people have seen The Raid 2? Yes. Should people have seen The Raid 1? Yes. <laughs> Did they see it? <laughs> no. I know, Nobody I, has seen The Raid 1 I'm still angry Raid about it. I mean, <laughs> there's probably a good percentage of our viewers who have seen The Raid and The Raid 2, right? But next right. to nobody else has. Right. So I'm okay with the concept. Look, will this remake be as good as the original? Probably not. And, and that's me being optimistic right, by right. saying just probably not. Right. But who cares? If it can bring this, that story and, that, and, and the Raid title and the Raid franchise to a North American audience, I guarantee this, it'll do the same thing that The Departed did for Inferno Affairs. I think just the production of this right. movie is going to turn some people on. It's like, oh, there were originals? Like yeah. Asian originals? Yeah. Okay, I'll check that out. Happened in droves the with Inferno Affairs. The Ring made people the watch Ring, Ringu. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know. So it can do, I think it can do nothing but good things for doing what you're talking about. Right. Get people to see those originals. And, and hopefully we'll get a half decent remake out of it too. Let's see what's next. Daddy Warbucks wants to know, can a reboot like Ben-Hur of a multi-Oscar winning film win again for the same awards like Best Screenplay? Well, from a technical point of view, yes, there's no rule against that. From a practical point of view, it's nearly impossible to win an Oscar. You know, 900 eligible films come out, one will win. Uh, so you already have a really finite opportunity to win. And then as a remake, can you win? Well, we just talked about The Departed. It was a right. remake and it won Best Picture. Right. Uh, a remake of an old classic, that's a tall order, man. I wouldn't put money on it. It's a tall order. What do you guys think? I, I'm with you. It's uh, nearly, I say nearly impossible. Nearly, yeah. Because, yeah, uh, The Departed was a remake of uh, Infernal Affairs, but that was a foreign film. Right. They remade it for America. This is remaking an American classic. Yeah, for different story. That, that everyone's already, seen, well, most everyone's already seen, already heard of. So I think the chances are very, very tiny. And on top of that, everyone who's part of the Oscars have already, they're old enough to have seen Ben-Hur in the theater. So they're yeah. like, what's this, you know, heresy of remake, you know? <laughs> they're going to feel about <laughs> remake the way you feel about the Raid remake. Exactly. <laughs> I've already seen Ben-Hur. Yes, right. I can't believe they're remaking Ben-Hur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, what's next? Yuri Korn Green says, what do you think about Doctor Strange film not being an origin film and that this strategy, strat strategy will continue in film Marvel future? I, I say strategy that way all the time, actually. Um, wow. Uh, well, if you heard me on Mailbag this weekend, or the special I did, good! We don't 
need origin stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I talked about this about Guardians of the Galaxy. I'll just recap quick. Guess what? There was no origin story for Peter Quill, for Drax Destroy, for Gamora, for Groot, for Rocket Raccoon, and yet we had a awesome movie, one right. of the best movies of the year. The, by, by just bringing, all we know about the background of Rocket is one 30 second piece of um, you know, dialogue saying, uh, he's a product of genetic mutation. And then him saying on the side, I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together again, again, again. That's all we knew. Right. You can do it. You can. And what I said on, on Mailbag this week, is like, look, if you give me a choice, say, John, next month, DC, we can snap our fingers and have DC release a brand new Wonder Woman Origins movie, in which I'd go, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Or, John, they could give you a Wonder Woman movie in which she's already established, not an origin story, and she's going to be going up against Ares. Well, sign me up for that one. Yes. I don't want the, the origin one. Yeah. Give me that one where right. we just, and, and then use a one or two minute scene where she talks about, you know, the, the island and she talks about the Amazonians. She talks about her birthright and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And then we're good to go. Yep. So I'm, I'm good with that. What do you guys think? I love that idea. I've, I've, I'm a big proponent. I was hoping that, you know, future Marvel films, whether they're Fox or Sony or whatever, they could just encapsulate that if they're rebooting things. I've always been a big fan in my mind of seeing like the Fantastic Four origin done in the title sequence and just <laughs> get to it. Doctor Strange, I mean, look at Doctor Strange and compare it maybe into the same world of something like The Conjuring. Now remember, those two people were like, hey, we've already been doing this, we've been investigating stuff, you got the whole story with the little doll, you had little flashbacks of things that affected her, like I can't deal with that again. You could do the same thing with Doctor Strange. He's mm -hmm. bam, he's, he's fighting Nightmare in the first five minutes of that film. Someone else is going to him for help because that's how Doctor Strange used to work in the old days. It was like people would go to him like, I can't, there's something wrong with it. Oh, there's a creature inside your brain. You know, he goes into your brain, you know. It's like, I mean, it's all crazy, psycho, you know, Ditko, I'm inside another dimension, <laughs> swirl I want to see that. I don't want to be wasting time with him being a surgeon and being in a car crash and climbing a mountain. That's an hour, My folks. My hands don't work the I way know. they used to. Well, maybe if you trained for another 30 minutes, no, <laughs> no. So I'm really excited about that news. It makes me extra excited. I love I Dr. Strange. I don't mind origin stories, but you don't have to tell them if right. they don't warrant it. And, and you can also do stuff either in flashbacks or just reference stuff, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you had Wolverine and the X-Men movies until his like solo film they didn't actually they kind of just hinted at what his backstory was but they didn't show it until they did show the visual flashbacks yeah, of him exactly. inside that yeah. getting injected exactly. you're like what's got what's and then that? they made the solo film of his origins and that was terrible so you know <laughs> and then and, and properly speaking the original Thor technically wasn't an origin he right. was already Thor by right. the time they started that movie already a, an, a, an esteemed warrior of the Asgardians and blah 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 he already had the hammer here I mean so yeah, it can work. And I think Doctor Strange, and remember, in Captain America 2, the guy on the roof, this is a little bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen it, he says, yeah, we're targeting you know, Tony Stark, Stephen Strange. Okay, so by him saying that on the roof, what that is saying is that Stephen Strange is already special, mm -hmm. and that by just dropping his name like that, it's assumed that those people that he's talking to already know the name Stephen Strange, right. so they're already kind of setting it up that he's already established. So. Yes. I kind of like that. All right, folks, we have run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today for this installment of AMC Movie Talk. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing on AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode, we do put out an audio podcast. Look in the description of this video, and you'll find the link to that audio podcast. So you can listen to us on the way to work or when you work out or when your mom's trying to talk to you or whatever. <laughs> it's all good with me. And don't forget to click the thumbs up button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, Mr. Dennis Zen. Dennis, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And also, I posted some pictures from the Geeky Awards that we were at. So yeah. Yes. Check that out. And of course, right beside him, who was also at the Geeky Awards last night, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you? you find me at Twitter and Instagram. And uh, like in an hour, I dropped my second trailer for The Death of Superman Lives. If you haven't joined the Thunderclap, just look it up online. And <coughs> you're only people watching it live can do it. So do it right now if you want to. Check it out. And of course, our lovely host today, Ms. Chrisley Kennedy. Chrisley, where can people find you? You guys can find me on all the social medias at Chrisley. And, of course, you can find me on the various social media channels as well, just at John Campia. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until next time, bye-bye.
Hey everyone, if you like this video, click that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. It's free and helps you stay up to date with all the latest movie news, as well as our daily AMC Movie Talk Show. Also, make sure that you follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with all of our special promotions, contests, and prize giveaways.